If you're in a relationship with an Enneagram 7, then one of the first things you should know is that their ego is telling them the world exists for my enjoyment. Sevens believe that life is good when it feels good and that it should feel good most of, if not all of the time. That's why sevens get stereotyped as the most fun Enneagram type. But if you've ever been in a romantic relationship with one, then you know there are plenty of bumps along the way and that's a lot of what we're about to get into. So with that said, here are my five key themes of relationships with Enneagram sevens. First, go with the flow and freedom moves fast, then anticipating appetites, and we're gonna talk about the Seven's confidence game and end with the commitment adventure. Okay, that's our roadmap. Time to get moving so we can keep up with the attention span of any Sevens that are along for the ride. Sevens are flow masters, and by that I mean they are the master of which direction and how fast the flow moves. Sevens hate rigid structures or being told what to do because that interrupts their flow. Sevens would much rather prefer to be in perpetual motion, and this preference is caused by their very subtle struggle with anxiety. Sevens are so fun-loving and upbeat on the surface that it often seems like there's no way they're riding a constant wave of anxiety, but that exact observation taps into several key aspects of the Sevens' unique place within the Enneagram. First, Sevens are in the head group of the triad centers along with type five investigators and type six loyalists. All head types have a major struggle with racing thoughts and a general concern about the future. Sevens just transform that anxiety into fuel, AKA their flow, which is always moving downstream. Next, there's the harmonic triad, which explains how each type copes with pain and sevens are in the positive outlook group along with type two helpers and type nine peacemakers. Positive outlook types do not do well with negative experiences or heavy emotions. So you mix up that desire to stay positive with a bunch of anxious energy and voila, you've got the sevens unique brand of going with the flow. In relationships, sevens will go from fun loving and excited to super frustrated the moment their partner tries to interrupt or control their flow especially by using any negative emotion or criticism because now they're tapping into all that dark stuff the seven spends their life avoiding. When it comes to facing things like grief, depression, or conflict, sevens refuse to be forced into the deep end of so-called negative experiences. Sevens want to diffuse fights with their partners as fast as possible, which means they never really get solved because a quick sorry doesn't get to the root of the issue. Sevens are also masters of reframing a negative thing into a positive thing in order to avoid feelings of guilt or remorse. Like, hey, it's a good thing you got so mad at me because we had some awesome makeup sex. On the bright side, their relentless optimism is priceless when you do have to face some adversity as a couple. But when it comes to your everyday relationship tension, sevens really have to work hard to build their tolerance for heavy conversations and true conflict resolution. And their partners are gonna have to work on having some serious patience for the sevens flow away from and hopefully back to these necessary conversations. All right, time for our next theme, which is all about freedom because you can't flow if you're not free, which sounds like a terrible 90s hip hop lyric, but we're gonna go with it. The Seven's ideal life would be one filled with the freedom to do whatever, whenever, wherever they want. If Sevens think something is awesome, they wanna be free to do it whenever they want and preferably right now. But that mix of urgency and independence can make it pretty difficult to have a stable, mutually supportive relationship because you can't predict what impulsive thing the Seven is gonna do next. But at least you'll know why they'll do it, which is that anxiety we just discussed in the previous theme. Sevens get anxious when they slow down because they start feeling like they're gonna miss out on one of life's amazing amazing opportunities if they're not constantly out in the world hunting for what's new and exciting. The common problem sevens have in relationships is feeling like their partner is an anchor slowing them down and limiting their opportunities to have this truly fulfilling life. This can be a pretty harsh observation and it's caused by the sevens mind pulling them so fast into the future that their heart often gets left in the dust. Sevens aren't really known for having a ton of sympathy, empathy, or patience for those that can't keep up. If you ask a seven to slow down, it's kind of like asking them to choose boredom over ecstasy. It's just not gonna happen because sevens are deathly afraid of boredom. A lack of stimulation just feels like sitting in a jail cell, which is the complete opposite of freedom. And it makes sevens sit with their heart, which tends to have this backlog of unprocessed negative emotions that they've been running from since childhood. Now. 
Another speed bump in the Seven's road to freedom is when they're faced with a complex decision of some kind. Sevens know that every choice has an opportunity cost, which if you skipped high school economics is just to say that every time you choose to do something, you also choose to not do something else. So the more complex the decision, the more anxiety arises in the Seven because they have to search their heart for what they truly want. A lot of times this comes up later in life for Sevens that need to choose between having kids and having less freedom, less money, fewer vacations, a sex life, date night, nights, a clean house, sleeping in, what else? Uh, career advancement, maybe? <laughs> you give up a lot when you have kids, at least for a season. Ultimately, sevens get healthy by choosing to slow themselves down, limit their own freedom, and withdraw from all that external activity in order to do some serious soul searching, which is usually characterized by their movement of integration to the type five investigator. But more on that later. Time to transition to our next theme, which is all about the sevens trademark appetite. In most popular Enneagram books, the Seven's core sin or ego fixation is described as gluttony or an excessive appetite. However, I prefer the way Russ Hudson from the Enneagram Institute describes their core struggle as an endless anticipation. It's not that sevens are never full, it's just that while they're eating, they're already thinking about the next meal, which kind of stunts their enjoyment of the present moment. This fixation goes all the way back to their childhood experience. Sevens may have a great relationship with their mom, but growing up, they just felt like the traditionally nurturing figure in the home didn't really nurture them. Their mom just may have been more focused on one of their siblings that may have had special needs Needs, or if she was a bit of a stoic intellectual, or maybe she had a career that just focused her attention outside the home. Whatever it was, Sevens just felt like they had to look after their own needs and nurture their own desires, and of course, find their own entertainment. As grown-ups, Sevens continue to entertain and nurture themselves with this endless anticipation of future experiences. This fixation makes Sevens naturally disinterested or just less concerned with other people's needs or building intimate relationships in general. Sevens just want to be free to go do the stuff they've been thinking about all day. And they don't really want to sit around at home and talk about their feelings. This sort of mindset can make Sevens endlessly entertaining partners because they've always got an awesome idea for how to spend the weekend or what to do on vacation. But again, once they're on vacation, they're already planning the next one rather than enjoying the place they actually are. Sevens only shut off this relentless anticipation by slowing down, savoring the moment, engaging their partner, and cultivating a sense of gratitude. Gratitude is huge for everyone, but for sevens, it really does unlock their greatest gifts on top of being a sort of grounding force that makes them far more precise and clear-minded in their decision-making. Interestingly, many sevens say that being out in nature has a deeply calming effect on their spirit that also nourishes their appetite and kind of settles the mind. So maybe a camping trip for your next vacation. Food for thought. All right. Time for our next theme, which is the Seven's Confidence Game. If you're in love with an Enneagram Seven, then you are well acquainted with their confidence game. It's probably what you were attracted to the moment they walked into the room. And if you affirmed their confident self-image in any way, and they were probably attracted right back at you. Sevens are the most naturally self-assured Enneagram type, and often rightfully so. Sometimes people even resent sevens because it just feels like amazing opportunities constantly fall right into their lap. But what all non-sevens, and especially their partners, should understand is that the sevens see the world through a lens of self-interest, even more than type fours and type threes that get hit with that narcissism label all the time. Now, I'm not saying that sevens can't do incredibly noble and sacrificial things. I'm just saying that they do that stuff with their self-interests in mind. Remember, at the very start of the episode, I said that sevens' ego is telling them that the world exists for their enjoyment. Think of how confident you'd be if you felt that way. I imagine it like in Harry Potter when he drinks the liquid luck and everything just kind of works out for him. Some would call that the law of attraction, others would call that BS, but either way, confidence gets you pretty far in life. Now, in regards to their long-term relationships, it's difficult for sevens to maintain this confidence game. There's just no such thing as true love without honesty, sacrifice, and deep pain all of which kicks the seven's confidence right in the junk. Now, your average or immature seven is so filled with self-assurance that they just don't feel like they have any major character flaws or significant behaviors that need to change. Sure, they're not a perfect person or anything, but even those flaws can be painted in a positive light like how an antique dresser is all scuffed up, but in a way that gives it character. But cut to moving in together, and you quickly realize how many significant issues the Seven needs to change. And now all that confidence looks like a ton of excuses for why they're right, why you just don't get it, and why it's not that you're wrong, it's just that you're a little rigid or set in your ways. Maybe you just need to learn to go with the flow. 
Okay, last thing I'll say about the Seven's confidence game is that deep down, they know it's just that. A game or a magic trick they do to keep everyone around them upbeat and entertained. Sadly, Sevens are the most effective Enneagram type when it comes to hiding their loneliness. There's not much their partners can do about it, as it all comes down to the Sevens' willingness to slow down, open up, and go on the adventure of commitment, which is our fifth and final theme. Sevens are the founders of FOMO, which comes from their constant need for new and exciting experiences. I know that doesn't exactly scream great at long-term commitments, but it's not to say that they can't be incredibly loyal, monogamous partners. It's just that they need the relationship to maintain a high degree of adventure, entertainment, and spontaneity. One of the best lines I've ever heard about relationships with Enneagram Sevens is that a shared imagination is more important than a shared heart. Average Sevens don't have a lot of access to their emotions, but they do have a ton of access to their mental playground. So that's often how their partners can at least meet them on their home turf. Now, the Seven's mind enjoys an abundance of options. They often double or triple book themselves so they can make the best possible choice at the very last moment once they've weighed out all their options. For Sevens, no means no, but yes means mm, maybe. But that kind of behavior causes major conflict with their partners because it feels like the Seven's priorities are always shifting. This happens as much in the Seven's work life and friendships as it does in their romantic life, so Try not to take it personally. At the end of the day, commitment in general is just a concept that your average seven is not comfortable with, even if they've been in committed relationships for years. To them, it just feels like no choice should ever have to be a permanent choice, so don't even bother fighting that mindset. The best option I can recommend for a sevens partner is just to embrace this picture of commitment as a daily adventure that you both choose to go on. And you may have no intention of ever ending that adventure, but you still have to treat it as if it's a day-by-day -day itinerary. Now I get how that might sound pretty unappealing to people looking for some rock-solid contractual commitment. But on the bright side, healthy sevens that are willing to limit some of their personal freedom in order to engage in a long-term committed relationship are some of the most infectiously joyful and generous people you will ever meet. So on that positive note, I'll transition to our final brief little bonus topic, which is all about the seven's preferred love language. After aligning the seven's core traits with the five love languages, I would say that words of affirmation is probably near the top of the list for most sevens because it affirms that high self-image that we just discussed. Next would probably be quality time because sevens take quality time to mean playtime with their playmates. Now, acts of service and gifts would probably be near the bottom, which leaves physical touch, and I'd say that's pretty dependent on your seven's instinctual variant. If you wanna learn more about the seven's instincts or anything else about sevenness in general, I've got a whole bunch of videos linked in the description for you below. Also, if you are a seven, let me know in the comments what your preferred love language is and why. Alrighty, that's a wrap on this overview of the Enneagram 7's core relationship themes. I've got videos on each Enneagram relationship pairing for the 7 coming out next, so be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of the new episodes as they drop. Just want to say thank you so much for watching. I very much appreciate your time and attention, especially my 7s that made it all the way to the very end. I see you, and I appreciate you. As always, I'm your host, Colton Simmons, and I'll see you next time on You've Got a Type. Bye.